Make testing. Make good. Make good. Yay! So thank you so much for, for being here. I'm very excited. It's going to be good, I think. Uh, my name is, as Ulf told you, oh, boop, boop, boop. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, maybe I need to click. Yeah, I needed to click. My name is Sebastian. Uh, so as I've told you, I used to study here, graduated 2017 spring. I studied uh, game design and graphics. Um, I uh, enjoy making video games and designing video games about feelings. And I also like enjoying drawing cute stuff and I enjoy animation. So drawing and animation and game design is like my core. Uh, I have been working at Tarsier Studios as a level designer since April 2018. Tarsier Studios is this medium-sized game development studio in Malmö. They've developed games such as the spooky adventure platformer Little Nightmares in the past, a VR puzzle game called Static, uh, and recently they also released The Stretchers, which is this wacky ambulance physics-driven game where you play as these ambulance people. It's pretty fun. And we've also announced Little Nightmares 2, uh, which, is, which is fun to do. Uh, so. But aside from that, aside from working as a level designer at Tarsier, I also have another job. It is unpaid thus far. It has a lot of responsibilities, uh, and I have no bosses. Uh, but the working hours are very flexible. Uh, and that job is co-developing turn-based strategy game, Birds with Feelings, together with my programmer magician, Jacep Rutkis, and a team of talented freelancers. The game started as this portfolio piece, but grew into a side project alongside my work at Tarsier. Uh, and we're currently finishing up the last bits of content before releasing early 2020, hopefully. Uh, we've also created a company to release this game with called Bird Pals. Uh, and that's sort of what this talk will be about. It's about the balance between working a job and developing an ambitious side project and then also having a sustainable, healthy life. So I'm asking, like, can you do that? And if you can, how do you do that? Uh, so I'm here to talk today about the strengths and weaknesses of developing a hobby project entirely during your free time. Uh, and I will share the things I have learned during this soon-to-be three-year development process. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge my limited perspective, however. I'm still working on Birds with Feelings, and the game is not even out yet. So I have all sort of complex feelings and, and emotions about the game. Uh, this means I don't have li really the distance from it yet. So writing this talk is actually being quite challenging, as it's hard to give concrete advice on how to avoid the mistakes I made when I'm still making them. Uh, so my experience is only one data point, and it's impossible to say if you will face the same challenges I have if you try making your weird game project in your free time. Uh, we're all unique people, and we all have our own set of challenges, and that does not make mine yours. But what I can do is to give my honest representation of my journey and how it has been for me, good and bad. And hopefully there will be something interesting and useful in there for you. But yeah, let's talk about feelings. But first, let's talk about birds with feelings. I would like to start by showing you a trailer of the game. Bear in mind, this is a tiny bit old, like a year old trailer, but it's still good, so let's see. Let's see. Oh no, there's no sound. Oh no, it didn't do it. Add a new player. Oh no, it's okay, we're gonna fix it. Yeah. Ah, uh, the YouTube is muted.
So yeah, Birds with Feelings is a turn-based strategy game where every bird are birds and feelings matter. It's set in this world populated entirely by birds and the player takes control of a squad of uh, bird diplomats and you're trying to stop a war entirely through conversations. On top of this, everyone has feelings and feelings affect combat and feelings change depending on what the player lets happen to their birds. So here you can see the player's notebook where they have, uh, where they're recording the feelings of their bird friends based on what happens to them. Every game round in Birds of Feelings, it plays a little bit like Sudoku. Birds are placed on a grid and then have a conversation with their opponents in an attempt to befriend them. The difference is that every bird has feelings and their feelings will change depending on if you let them be alone, if they win or lose the fight, if they didn't get to participate in the fight, their feelings will change. Uh, so it's up to the player to not only thrive in the sort of current confrontation, but also to guide their feelings of the bird team to be strategically beneficial, beneficial for future confrontations. The player also gets to sort of know their bird team personally, finding out their dreams, seeing how they grow, and experiencing how uh, what the player does to the birds affect the, the bird's feelings, the bird's personality and, and journey. So Birds with Feelings started doing a game jam organized by Game Camps, which is an organization to help startups across, uh, across borders. It was in spring 2017 in Latvia. Uh, personally, I was trying to produce as many portfolio pieces as humanely possible in order to get hired as a game designer eventually. So I left at all the game jams because I was a student. I had carried the idea uh, of a game where feelings affect the gameplay in a concrete way for a long time. And on the plane to the game jam, I was doodling a bunch of birds in my notebook. So when I arrived to the jam, I pitched the idea of a game where you have a team of birds and manipulate their feelings for the greater good. A team of about five people joined me, and it turned into this thing. A fun, janky little game where you fought vultures and emotions uh, with emotions and changed the feelings of your team by having them win or lose, be close to friends or far away. And this core mechanic actually stayed the same throughout the rest of the development, this like basis of placing birds and seeing how the feelings change. What I did not know going into the game jam was that the winner of the jam would receive a bunch of money earmarked for further development of the game, provided they start a company that is cross borders. And we did win. So the question was, who wanted to continue development? Well, me and Jasset Rutkis were in the unique position of just about to finish university with no job lined up. So we were down to work without pay to create this portfolio piece. Uh, he, and, he and me decided to finish the game over the summer and release it in fall as a tiny, three, uh, as a tiny portfolio piece. So it was like meant to be this three-month project. No worries. Um, that did not happen. Um, our scope was quite high for our time budget, and we were only two people, me doing the game design, all the art, and him doing the programming. Uh, a common theme in Birds with Feelings development are missed deadlines. I believe the core reason for this is that we did not have the necessary structure to facilitate our development. Uh, I think Albertina's talk will go over how to plan your projects more consistently and implement the necessary structures you need way better than I ever could. But I do know we didn't even try to have the structure at first. Uh, and now that we are trying, we're still kind of bad at it. Uh, I think there's a bunch of reasons we missed deadlines. One of them being that we didn't really try <laughs> to scope in a proper way. We just did things. Neither of us acted as a producer, neither of us kept track of how long things took, and we didn't follow up on missed estimates for how tasks, long tasks would take, uh, and we didn't plan sprints based on previous experiences. Uh, we were also making a game in a genre we had never worked in before, so there was a lot of missteps and confusion, which is understandable. We also had full-time jobs, parts of development, and consistently underestimated how much time we would be able to work and how much long things would take. Finally, I honestly think we did not deep down want to realize how long it would take. Uh, we just told ourselves it would always be three months away, because if it would have been three years and we would have known that, we would not have done this. We, we would not. So I think it was like a self-defense mechanism to just go, oh, it's just 
this summer and then it's done. Oh, it's just this winter and then it's done. Oh, it's just this next summer and then it's done. And the show goes on. <laughs> but we worked during the summer and we showcased a ga the game at uh, a Latvian game uh, conference called Unicom. And this is the, the build for that. And during the summer, we had added abilities to the game, health, a map one could navigate, as well as a very janky leveling system. I also went to Visby during this time with another version um, to play test with a lot of students here, which was really useful. But it was clear from play tests that the game wasn't finished. How do you know? Um, players enjoyed the basis of the game, but there were also a lot of bugs and a lot of missing feedback for features. We were also incredibly ambitious. In a time when we were supposed to wrap up the game, we decided to add a relationship system. This was promptly removed for the next milestone, but it will be forever missed. Maybe for the sequel. <laughs> but development continued throughout the fall, past our initial three months estimate. Now we envisioned finishing before the end of the new year. Uh, so we made another build. In September, we had a new intro for the game, an event system that could display dialogues to get some of that visual novel juice goodness in there, as well as a per year map. Uh, and we were getting closer and closer to the game we envisioned, but the playtest just kept giving mixed feedback. Players were confused about how features were presented, and the tutorial just didn't exist. The game broke down often as well, blocking players from experiencing the gameplay loops we had envisioned and needed to test. We also had no content except for a single map screen, this map screen. Uh, but always, the game was just three months away from the finish line. We figured since it was a system-based game, adding content would already take a weekend, right? During the fall, Jacob got employed at a game company and started full-time work there. He worked on birds when he could, while I continued semi-full-time from home. This was a pretty rough time for me. I was developing the game from home while simultaneously doing work applications and finishing up my thesis. Uh, I was not taking care of myself and felt like I was not doing enough. And I will talk more on this later as well. We also did not have a clear goal for when the game would be finished or what the next, uh, or what the next like, important bit was. So working on it and selecting what to work on was always a challenge. Eventually, I just started working on things I enjoyed doing, like animations and characters since doing some work is better than just doing the right work. Again, our structure made it hard to, to even approach the game and go, oh, I'm gonna work on this. But in our minds, we thought the game was almost complete-ish, uh, and thus we wanted to give it to playtesters and try it as truly we could, uh, as well as build a community. So in December 2017, we released a build along with a Discord community. Uh, and here we made more changes. We had a new UI inspired by Hearthstone's UI, where the player actually has a proper notebook to take notes in. Uh, I overhauled the combat UI once again, changing how feelings are displayed to match the notebook. Uh, we also added more tutorials, as well as more backgrounds. And then, in April 2018, I gave the friendly birds different animations depending on their emotions. We had an emotional danger zone system, suggested by Marcus Ingvarsson, who is also having a talk this week, uh, which encouraged players to balance the emotions of the birds rather than putting them on the extremes of feelings. We also updated how the event system looks to be a tiny bit more snazzy and added more content written by Tuva, our writer. But of course, there was more to do. There's always more to do. The leveling system confused players and felt unbalanced. The abilities were also confusing players. Uh, the game had a ton of content missing, and we were unsure if the core mechanic of manipulating feelings would really work out in the long run. We didn't know if it was deep enough. So it was clear we needed to continue iterating and find out how to fix this to make the game uh, what it deserved to be, to make a good game. And then I got a job. So I like to talk about some of the obstacles I faced when working with games and then working with games as a hobby, and then also trying to have a life. So first of all, I want to highlight that even being allowed to work on a hobby project during your free time is not a given. 
a lot of game companies have contracts stating that they own everything you create, including things creating your free time using your own resources. Other times, a contract can state that you are not allowed to make any money on products you produce outside of work. So it does make sense from a business perspective. A company wants you to focus on your creative energies on the work you do for them, not go off on like a hobby project and disappear. But not all companies are like this. Uh, and fortunately for me, there was no problem with this at Tarsier. But I would recommend double checking this if your hobby projects are important to you. But I got the green light from Tarsier and I got to continue development. Uh, the next step was to make time for it. And time is hard. Uh, I discovered it is not impossible for me to make things during my free time while having a full-time job, but it's also not easy. Uh, let's say I spend eight hours per day working my full-time job. How much time is left on the hobby project? I tried a whole bunch of configurations. For example, working normally during weekdays and then dedicating a weekend day to bird day, spending, for example, Sunday making birds. I also tried getting up at 6 a.m., starting to work on birds from 7 a.m. to 8.45, and then working my real job from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's 11 hours of the day dedicated to work, which with a little space for a one hour lunch, uh, which is, it's nice because there was a lot of consistency. You know you're gonna get back to it every day. Uh, and the weekend was free, but it was also quite stressful to work on the game in such short bursts and it was not very sustainable for my health. And then I also tried reducing bird time. Recently, I started to take my weeks free, except for working, and dedicating a maximum of four hours per weekend to bird game. Usually, I get up at 7 a.m. on Sundays, and I do the laundry while working on the game between the laundry passes. Um, but at the end of the day, though, if I like try my very best, I'll get at most get to spend like eight hours per week on the game. Like that's the that's then I'm doing a really good job. Uh, and that's not a lot of time, one work day per week. And here is where boundaries come in. So I'm sure you all know how hard it is to make games. Uh, a game's not just a set of features, it's this complicated web of things like gameplay and graphics and UI, level design, tutorial, music, sounds, etc. And then the player interacts with it and somehow, sometimes, somehow, there's a game there. Uh, but it's really hard to know when a game is finished and what it needs uh, due to this complexity, when to let go or when to polish it further. To me, game development is like this insatiable beast eating your energy and time. And I can polish it and expand it forever, but it'll still want more of me. Uh, in our case, this was a project of constantly missed deadlines. I never felt like we were doing enough. And that weight uh, wavered very heavily on me. Um, however, especially when time is limited, I have found it is extra important to set clear boundaries around your hobby work. For example, last weekend I was writing this talk, but then uh, I was also committed to finishing up some final boss fights for the game, as well as handling some business stuff. But this talk took longer than I expected to finish off, and at the end of Sunday, I had finished the talk and the business things, but I hadn't gotten to work on the game itself. And here I have a choice. I can pressure myself to work extra during the week in an attempt to finish the game stuff before the next batch of tasks come in the next week. Or I can accept that the work won't be done, prioritize my health, and push the deadlines further. All choices are bad, but at the core, this was a failure of planning, I suppose. Um, and in a lot of these cases, a downward spiral is created where I have this goal I want to achieve um, and then I miss the goal and then feel like I have to compensate for it during the next work week and work extra hard. Uh, but that makes me more tired and then the next weekend comes and I'm exhausted and cannot perform either. And since I step over the working hours of birds to compensate for not performing, suddenly there is no time when I should not be working because I am always behind. So I end up feeling guilty anytime I'm not working, which is ridiculous and not good, in my opinion. <laughs> Additionally, uh, I found that when my main motivation to work is based solely of a fear of not doing enough, I performed horribly and I felt horrible too. 
So throughout this process, I have started to clearly define how much of myself I'm willing to spend on bird suit fillings. And I started to measure my success, not through my work output, but through the time I do put in and my personal health. To enforce these boundaries and ensure I don't constantly feel guilty, I defined specific bird hours that cannot be overstepped or worked outside of. Even if I'm super behind schedule, even if the world is burning, I will not work outside of them. Um, so I think it's really important to set these boundaries and keep them as much as possible. Health is more important than productivity, which brings me to my next point, health. This is a picture of me exercising and sleeping and relaxing at the same time. That's the ideal state to be in at all times if you can. Um, but I need to ask you, are you all taking care of us now? Are you sleeping eight or nine hours per night? Are you well rested? Do you exercise regularly? Do you have a support network you can lean on when the going gets tough? Do you have friends who care about you and are willing to hear you whine about your janky leveling systems or design choices or bad graphics? I don't know, because that's really nice to have. Do you eat enough and regularly and are you eating the things your body needs? And do you take time to relax and enjoy time off? Do you have hobbies and side interests? Basically, making games as a hobby project is a constant strain on health. It's a constant strain on relationships and on the work-life balance. In my opinion, it is essential to take extra good care of yourself before and during a period like this. Uh, it's also a nice way to avoid burnout. And the thing is, if you don't have these things, they're solvable problems. I was bad when, uh, of taking care of myself when I started this, and I uh, still am to a degree. I prioritized work over my health for the longest time. Uh, more on that later. But paying at more attention to my health has given me way more joy than any game development process could. So I highly recommend it. But we still made the game. Uh, the show must go on. I was still learning this boundary stuff in June of 2018, trying to figure out how to balance my new Malmo life with this bird quest past, with this bird quest that this past Sebastian had sent me on. In uh, June 2018, we released version 1.6 of Bird Game. Our current plan at the time was slightly more reasonable. We wanted to finish the game by December 2018 and release it on Valentine's Day 2019. This meant we needed to get the game content complete until around December 2019. But of course, all of the expectations on the game built up over the years made it hard to compromise and scope down. We wanted to figure out the remaining design problems and communication issues very badly <laughs> because we saw a cool game at the end of the tunnel. So for this update, we changed the leveling system into something simpler and easier to understand that played into the core mechanics of the game manipulating feelings. And we also updated the conversations once again. And then something really interesting happened in October. We realized that the core activity of the game, fighting enemies, does not really fit the message of the game. So we decided to make one last big change before calling our feature freeze. We turned the battles into conversations instead. The setup now was that the birds were diplomats, not warriors. They were trying to befriend everybody and make peace, not war. If they failed, they'd get beaten up by the opposing vulture. This also solved a bunch of communications problems and made the overarching direction and sort of marketing of the game much cleaner. It felt like a decision that honed in on what we were trying to do, like the game had just sort of been waiting for us to realize this. We also changed up the map screen to be horizontal and tried to make modeler maps to save time and it didn't look that great as you can see. But that's okay, it's a part of the process. We also removed uh, level abilities from this version because we finally started to realize we need to scope down a little bit and abilities didn't really add to the player's experience. These weren't really there, uh, they're not functional, they're just there because we didn't remove them uh, visually. <laughs> So 
So, in our heads, the game was now feature complete, which meant we were only a month or two away from finishing it, right? Our plan was still to finish the game in December of 2018, and then release it on Valentine's Day 2019. That's fantastic. And maybe if we had just focused on the game itself, we could have gotten a janky version of it finished. Unfortunately, almost all the time from this game build in October 2018 was spent uh, on everything except for game development. Now, in our mind, we would spend a month tops finding and putting freelancers to work because we had that funding, right? Which was great. Uh, in reality, I spent the next three months just talking to potential freelancers, negotiating costs and terms, and directing them. There was no time what whatever uh, spent on developing the game itself. And that is something I took with me. Game development is much, much more than game development. It is also marketing, directing, keeping tracks, track of tasks, businesses, and managing people. And I found that if you're doing it in your free time, it, it's hard to have the time to do multiple things at the same time efficiently. Uh, if I work eight hours per week on the game, it will be really hard to direct freelancers uh, and also get development stuff done without compromising my mental health. Right? It's just very hard to do that within eight hours. For example, we wanted to create an announcement trailer as well as a website to host the trailer. Just doing the director direction for the trailer and the website took all of my time leading after the day we released the website and trailer on Valentine's Day. There was no time for development. But we were also invited to go to GDC by the Game Camps Project. GDC, woo! Uh, in our minds, this was a great opportunity for the game and it was also a really good opportunity for me to practice my boundaries and prioritize my health. At the end of the day, I didn't go to GDC. I said no. I knew it would be so taxing on my already mental, fragile health. So instead, Jasseps went and stayed home, and I stayed home as support. So it's important to take care of yourself, and you can do it, even if your game goes to GDC. Uh, but for the GDC build, which we made, we created a new start menu. We drew up a new intro pan down shot, which we also used in the trailer. And we also created the first finished world of the game with complementary map art. Uh, we also did a bunch of smaller tweaks and fixed bugs and we improved readability. Just a bunch of testing and UX design and stuff. And then things got slower. After rushing to get everything in order after GDC or uh, for GDC, both me and Jaseps were exhausted. We had no real clear plan for what the finished game would mean, and we had missed all deadlines set in the past, so it was kind of hard to commit to a new one. And the game still had things that needed doing, like it didn't have any content, it just had that one map screen. I spent multiple weeks at, the, at this time kind of just like avoiding thinking about the game, but I knew I would need to pick it up eventually and I was just filled with a lot of guilt and frustration. And here, a practice I have slowly learned over these past two years becomes very, very important. You gotta be nice to yourself. It's, it's so easy, for me at least, to feel like I'm not enough when I'm doing so many things. Doing all of this means I don't have a lot of capacity. I am cranky and sometimes insensitive and I make stupid mistakes. I overcook the porridge and I forget to pick up the laundry. I oversleep and I bite my tongue by accident when sleeping, uh, when eating. I catch myself being tense for hours on end. I skip office parties because I feel so drained and alone. And I'm so mad at myself for even doing this crazy game stuff in the first place, but also mad that I can't do the things I set out to do. It's ridiculous. <sighs> but. I think the truth is, is that this is pretty hard. And in my experience, the only way to sort of help yourself when you find that you're doing a lot of mistakes or haven't been perfect is to show some compassion for yourself. Give yourself the understanding and love you would give a friend in a same situation. So I'm trying to be nice to myself. And I think you should be too. It's more important than video games or careers or laundry but eventually, 
with some help for some with help from some friends, I created a plan for what the game needed content-wise to be considered finished. With this plan, we will be done with the game in 2020, meaning it didn't rely on the game being done in the next three months. So that was nice. That was new. The plan also had a lot of buffer, so we, we accepted it and started working on it. However, me and Jaseps were also exceptionally tired at this stage. I felt very burned out. Even after weeks of development, the pro oh sorry, even after several weeks of the bird project to recover, I straight up just didn't want to work on it. The end was so far away and felt so unachievable, and I started to wonder if it was even reachable at all. The plan, uh, and the plan was accepted by the entire team, but we quickly slipped out of schedule again when we were unresponsive and slow. My life was slowly starting to crumble as well. Bird game was weighing heavily on my friendships and relationship, and I did not feel like I had the time or energy to spend time with friends, or myself for that matter. I was completely drained, and everything felt like a huge chore. I had lost all semblance of curiosity and joy for game creation process itself. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, depression at this time, and it was clear that I needed to make some changes in my life. And to be clear, I'm still making those changes. I'm slowly learning to prioritize my health over my games. And it's, it's a process, and that's okay. But as a part of this process, I took a long, hard look at the game and tried to figure out what to do with it. I could stop working on it, but then we would lose two years of work. I would disappoint my teammates, and it would always linger in my mind as something I could not finish. Finally, my partner suggested that I might be able to take some time off work to work on the game. And to me, this felt like a wonderful idea, if I could make it happen. Imagine after two years of only working on your game in scraps to get to work for full days on it. Each day would be like a full week of work. I calculated that if I would work for a full month of Burst with Feelings full time, that would be like working on my at my current pace for 20 weeks. That's like 38.4% of a year. That's a lot of time. So I asked my work and miraculously, the timing was perfect for me to take a month of unpaid vacation. So I did it. I burned a month of uh, salary on birds, and I did it in a heartbeat. So September became a bird timber, and for one month, I worked on the game full time. Uh, during this time, with a reduced scope and semi-clear planning, the game got kind of finished. Uh, in October 2019, we released a new milestone for the game and shared it with friends and interested acquaintances. I'm very proud to say that finally, it seems that the experience players are having are kind of matching up with our aesthetic goals. People are understanding our tutorials, the overarching goals, and they connect with the main characters. We have a proper progression with a beginning, middle, and end. And we even have a final boss. It's thrilling and terrifying to say that the game is pretty close to being done now. And I think it'll be unique, interesting, and weird. This version of the game rehauled the early game tutorial to explain it better. It also had four new worlds. So that's complete four new, completely new maps with the backgrounds and backgrounds inside of the backgrounds and everything. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's so much content. We also worked on various UI improvements. Birds now speak about different things when talking to their vultures, depending on what they're feeling. So here, Rebecca, she's friendly, so she's like talking about shaking hands with other birds, whereas a military bird would speak about uh, working out, for example. Sorry, a confidence bird, not a military bird. We also changed up how feelings are shown on the emotional report as well as in battles to give clearer feedback on what was going on. You can see the emotional changes there. We also iterated on the map UI a tiny bit more uh, to make it a little bit snazzier. Looks okay. So that's the gist of what we've done so far. It has been over two and a half years of development, 
and it will most likely delve into three years before we can call this completely done. I've spent countless hours thinking about the game, talking about it, drawing birds, animating them, tweaking design choices, coming up with solutions to problems, and managing the team. So, throughout all of this, I think one question I struggled the most with is very simply, why? Why do I keep working on this game? This was initially obvious to me, but the answer changed a lot as development progressed. And the question became increasingly more important as my life slowly crumbled and I had to keep making sacrifices to continue working on the game. Economical sacrifices, sacrifices regarding my mental health, sacrifices related to my social life and relationships. Uh, right now, I honestly doubt I will ever want to design a game for fun again. Right? That's kind of a bummer, right? That sense of childlike wonder uh, has gone out. Hopefully only temporarily, though. So again, why do it? Why make games like this? Why make games at all? At the start of the project, I carried external as well as internal motivations. I wanted to get another game in my portfolio so that I could get a job and feel safe. I did want to explore this weird gameplay idea I've had for a while and sort of see what it was. But I think at the core of it, I have a need to prove myself, to prove my worth by creating things. Through the love and praise I receive for my work, I feel validated. And that has always been a part of me. And before this project, I didn't really question it too much. That means that the game had to be recognized and validated for it to succeed and for me to make it. And for most part of development, my motivation has been based solely in fear of this. I was afraid of finishing the game because then that would be the game and there would be no way to approve on it. And this shitty unpolished thing we would release would be the final game. And then I had spent two my years of my life making a poop. And people would look, look at the game and go, oh, it had so much potential if only it was designed by smarter people, etc. And then there's also the fear of not finishing at all, right? Of losing the work we have put into it and just like it whiffing out or finishing it but no one caring at all. And these are fears. They're not necessarily helpful or necessarily through true thoughts, but I had them daily for so long, especially when I was working on the game. I was just straight up an anxious wreck. I was hesitant to talk about the game in fear of getting anyone else excited for it and thus creating more expectations and pressure. I was blocking people from playtesting it because it wasn't perfect. It had bugs and the design wasn't perfect. So the motivation and curiosity I had for developing it had fallen away and only fear remained. Fear of stupidly losing two years of work Fear of being judged for that work if we did release it. Fear of being a disappointment and fraud. But I did get a job where I felt pretty appreciated. And I got into a loving, uh, a loving relationship. And I realized that people seem to like me, even if I don't make stuff all the time. And I had my priorities a bit turned around. And... Uh, I think it's important to, to realize that you don't have to make things to be nice. You can just like exist. It's okay. <laughs> and I realized also that there's also really good reasons to finish this game. Reasons I'm trying to focus on instead of all this fear I have. Here's some good reasons. I have a genuine interest in the game we're making. I think the gameplay is interesting and new and weird and I think it deserves to be out there. I think the message of the game itself is fresh and important. It's about communication and compromises and people. And I think that's worth working for. I'm doing it to learn, for learning itself, learning how to finish things, how to manage a project, learning how to cope, learning how to set boundaries, learning how to prioritize health, and also learning how to design strategy games, I guess. Uh, I'm also finishing it so that I can put this past Sebastian who had these expectations to rest and focus on taking care of myself and finding out what I want to do without all of this fear. Because a part of me is still screaming to finishing it so that they can, they can move on. 
and uh, it's true that my fears are still there. They're, they're not gone. There's a bunch of things in the game that are unpolished and bad, and I think they will stay unpolished and bad. But I am actively choosing to focus more on the constructive reasons for making the game. Reasons that will still be valid, even if no one cares about it. Reasons with grounded expectations and lower pressure. Long story short, I found that if my motivation is based in curiosity rather than fear, my work will be better for it, as well as my health. So yeah, video games. Let's summarize what we have, what I have learned in this process, and hopefully there's some useful bits in there. Have a clear deadline to work towards with achievable, measurable goals. If you're bad at planning, like me, ask your friends who are good at planning for help. That's something I tried, and it was really useful. Accept that your game will never be, will never be pleased with the meager amounts of hours you spend on it. Set clear times for work, and do not let it slip into your personal life. Your hobby project is still kind of work. Instead, prioritize personal health and make sure that you have what you need as a human. Remember, game dev is so much more than game dev. Uh, and remember that one busy human cannot wear all of the hats at the same time without them feeling heavy quite quickly. So maybe you can get some other people to do the, do the boring stuff for you or, or set clearer time for it. And also be nice to yourself, because you are more important than some stupid video game. I'm serious. And finally, figure out why you're doing this in the first place. It has changed uh, a lot over the years for me. And, and figuring out the question to this answer and making it more constructive have really, really had a big impact on how I approach this. So there you have it. Six easy tips for making games in your free time. <laughs> Please stay safe out there and be nice to yourself and others and just like, do, your, do your kindest. Thank you so much and good luck. <laughs> and now I think we have time for questions. Um, so the main thing with my job is we have, uh, in my opinion, we have a pretty worky, sorry, healthy working culture at my job. So people go home and they go to work and when they go home, they're done. Um, so it, it was mostly, and there's also other people doing hobby stuff and it's like a part of the culture and we talk about that stuff. So I it wasn't really a big problem. The biggest impact it had was that I asked to go down to seven hour days uh, early 2000 and this year, 19. <laughs> uh, so I've been working one hour less, but like no one has ever commented on it. And uh, I feel that really, like it's really chill. Like I think it's fine. Uh, and I, I know that probably depends on the workplace you have and what culture you are. But fortunately for me, it hasn't really impacted it too much. Thank you for your question. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> so the question was, how much money have I spent on a mon project together? You know, I was thinking about doing a calculation like this for the, for the talk, but then I didn't, because I'm scared. <laughs> um, but I did spend a month's salary on it, and I've gone into seven hour working days, which means I lose, I, am, I have like 87.5% of my salary, uh, which is a lot of money as well. And then I've also spent a lot of my mental health, which I think is like the biggest investment to like, make the game. So it's a lot of money. Uh, it takes a lot of money and time and effort. And you can also go into like, what would I have done if I hadn't made this game? You know, would I, could I have spent that time better? Uh, 
It's a good question, and I can't answer it very well. Thank you, though. So the question was, how much time has passed since I uh, I got my job? Ah, yes. Uh, so I graduated uh, spring 2017, and then it was roughly half a year, uh, and then I got a job in April 2018. Sorry, uh, and I I had the job secured around Christmas, but it was a couple of months of buffer there to to finish my bird game. <laughs> I'm serious, I asked for extra time to finish this game. Oh. <laughs> um, so, about six, eight months, I think, uh, from when I graduated, when I had the job. Maybe more. Thank you. There's a question here. Mm. Mm. So the question was what I did in the time between I graduated and I, I got the job and if I started applying while I studied. Um, so I didn't apply any to anything while I still studied, mostly because I was really stressed out and busy with this game. <laughs> Um, and I was also organizing uh, more things than I should and writing a thesis. Um, but I spent the summer doing more a life drawing course, like drawing naked people. And then during the fall, I thought I would finish the game and then start applying for jobs. But then I didn't, so then I just started applying for jobs around, uh, I think it was October or November. And then I, I finally got a connection and got the job in like early, 2018 or late 2017. Um, so I worked on the game, I did some courses, and I, I finished my thesis as well, because it wasn't finished. Uh, and then I also applied late fall and got the job early spring. Ah. Right, surviving. Yeah, I was... <laughs> <laughs> How did I survive? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. I had a really good uh, opportunity to just move back home for a while. So that's what I did. I moved home after the summer and just stayed at home for like half a year. Uh, so that's a big privilege I have. And I really, that really helped me out. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. yes. So the question was, since we really don't really have a workers union in the games industry, what would happen if I burned out and fell ill uh, at my job from doing all this stuff? That's a good question, thank you. Um, that, which I can't give a very good answer to. I believe there are regulations around this and laws uh, where like if someone falls ill while they work for some somewhere, they will get help from that workplace. Uh, but I don't have the specific details because I'm a, just a goofy game developer person. But does anyone here know the answer to that question? If there's any regulations in place or? Mm. Mm. Just, oh. Yeah, it's not a good time when you don't feel safe at work. That's horrible. Um, 
I haven't really experienced that in my workplace. So I haven't really, I have been really privileged in that. So I haven't had to look this up. So unfortunately, I cannot give you a straight answer. But I would love to talk more about this and, and we can do some Googling and figure it out together. Because <laughs> I need to know this now. <laughs> Are you happy? Um, OK, thank you for your questions. Very good questions. <laughs> so what are some of your favorite ways of uh, unwinding of the doing all this uh, strenuous process of developing your games? Like, what are your favorite activities or ways to just take your mind off it? Mm, what has kept you sane? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, my top thing when I feel really stressed out and can't stop thinking about work is to go climbing. Uh, climbing is like my go-to exercising activity. And it's a way to just like make my body do something really intensely for a while. And then usually a lot of the thoughts go away as well. Uh, so just exercising really, really helps me. Uh, but then also spending time with friends and saying, like really establishing my mental state, like going, hey, I'm stressed out and there's a lot going on here. So I might be a little out of it, but uh, I appreciate you spending time with me. And uh, I want to make this the best we can. And just like establishing that and then letting it be what it is, even if you're like a bit tired and down. Because it's okay to be tired and down. Just setting that boundary is nice. And so friends exercise. Not video games though. <laughs> I don't I've stopped doing video games because it's uh it's a trap <laughs> for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what are your marketing plans for this mm. project? That's also a good question. Thank you. We do have marketing plans. Stop giggling. <laughs> 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 uh, so essentially, the game is... Our marketing plans, as it is, is that we have a community manager who is uh, responsible for the marketing, uh, Danny, and he's doing a good job. Um, so essentially, we have given the marketing plans to someone else, and we're just hoping it'll be good. And this is a case where we know we can't do it very well, so we're letting someone else do it how they do it. Um, so, But uh, at the root of this is that we have this very niche, weird game, so we're trying to build up a community for it over the development of the game and sort of get people interested. And then when we actually release it, we hope we have this community sort of spread the word. But I think a part of this is also that we don't really have time to consider these factors too much because it's not it's not a commercial project so to speak it's more of a could be commercial project if people like it but it's more of a ambitious hobby project you know so since we don't really have that financial pressure on us since we have jobs we haven't really tried to really really define how to to get the audiences we need we're just admitting that we don't know what we're doing, and then we're doing what we know what we're doing, like making video games, but not marketing. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, it's a niche game, so we're trying to reach the people who uh, are into this experience and trying to market it to them. But that will also come into more when we go into our marketing period after finishing the game. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Platforms I am targeting. We are targeting PC, Steam, and... Uh, GOG and Humble Bundle right now. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Um, just had a question. Since you said that, uh, that you don't really play games on your free time, mm. uh, because at least for what I have been managed to see is what like fantasy offers still read fantasy books, musicians still listen to music and stuff like that. But something that I've kind of discovered is most game people, game developers, doesn't really play video games mm. because, as you said, it's a trap. Mm. Do you can you maybe elaborate a bit more on that point? I, I would love to. That's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do play video games that I find interesting and want to research. For example, I played a whole hour of Disco Elysium yesterday. So good. <laughs> um, th the thing I mean with a trap is that 
I try to stay away from uh, habit creating games because uh, they trap me very easily and they give very very clear rewards for playing them which makes it it essentially makes the game more entertaining than doing real life for me al at times like when I'm really down that easily happens for example I used to play a lot of Hearthstone uh, and that easily trapped me uh, and Subnautica also has been a big time sink so I'm trying to focus on games that are like you play them for a while and then they're done because I just always get trapped in them uh, that's the approach I have thank you It's time for lunch. Let's eat some stuff.